Eumenides, The Benevolent Ladies, by Adam L. G. Neville. On his first day at work, the only thing that had enthralled Jason was Electra and her legs. For the next two months, his admiration developed into a fixation, lasting from morning until home time in the logistics office at the distribution center of Agritech. Jason found Electra's egresses away from his desk, mesmerizing. Whenever his wayward scrutiny lowered to her legs, she seemed to perpetually be doing only that forever moving away from him, while tantalizing him in a way that was more torment than pleasure. Electra was the only light within the darkness of his working life, the sole distraction he welcomed, and even though his position at the distribution center seemed intent on erasing the last of his individuality and his hopes for anything better in life, he secretly tingled in anticipation of each working day because she was always in those days sweetly perfumed tastefully painted soft virtually mute a silky presence with thighs that susurrated between the desks and the grey metal shelving a siren mounted upon the tipped heels that created their own strange music when she teetered along the concrete flawed aisles or sent a staccato beat across the vast tarmac spaces designed for cars and delivery vehicles under that forever grey of sky engulfing Agritech. Jason's job and office both confined within the enormous but sparsely staffed logistics hub for agricultural engine and machine parts was a place that did not matter. Agritech and the town that hosted it, Solid upon Trent, was a part of the North Midlands that wasn't quite the Black Country or Staffordshire. A bit of both, but not regarded as either. Solid upon Trent or Sully had no meaning geographically, culturally, or politically. It boasted no public life or attractions for visitors. The area was a kind of antimatter and stuck at the intersection of new, fast roads that swept people past it. Within a week of Jason's hasty departure from another dead space just beyond the M25 in what might have been Buckinghamshire, where he had landed after university Five years previously, when aiming for London's media world, he'd become even more disappointed with Salt upon Trent. It now seemed to him that his life was destined to waste away among dual carriageways, metal fences, eerily quiet industrial estates, white vans, new houses built on railway embankments, and warehouse-style shopping malls containing pet suppliers and white goods stores the size of football stadiums. He found that Solace upon Trent and its ilk offered the antithesis of a life that one could engage with, embrace, or be invigorated by on any level. Such locations offered existences rather than opportunities to attain any kind of essence. As a consequence, they remained areas devoid of vitality. He'd also discovered that the places of work within them were usually created and peopled by concentrations of the unimaginative. Sully filled Jason with a particular apathy and inertia common to such zones. They made him listless, but occasionally eager to scream or laugh hysterically, or to inflict physical damage upon his surroundings. Increasingly, 
The longer he lived in Sully, he thought of himself as a caged ape, dressed in a cheap suit. One left in a narrow and littered cement enclosure, forever bereft of visitors, a forgotten and unexceptional primate that incessantly slapped its own face with a big leathery hand. Jason only kept his mind alive by ordering books online and reading them patiently in his room, seeking self-knowledge as well as answers about how to better deal with his lot, until he managed to escape. His reading was also an attempt to cup his hands around the small, bright flame that three years ago at university had ignited. If that tiny fire was doused, he feared who he might become, perhaps a man that would also forget who he had once been. Here too, as with his last job, his colleagues were mostly men, painfully ordinary, but somewhat cynical and prescribed to a limited discourse that mostly revolved around football, cars, IT, gaming, drunkenness and handheld gadgetry. Even in its briefest form, the office discourse made Jason's heart smolder with a frustration born of morbid boredom. Online dating sites had only returned the profiles of eight single females within his reach geographically, and the profiles had all looked fake. Romantic opportunities to relive his demoralizing loneliness was slender. The Sully women that didn't leave the area appeared to marry early and become mothers even earlier. Only Electra appeared different. Who was she and what was she doing here? No doubt she had not long left further education, probably had a boyfriend. Whenever he came across her during the lunch intervals, as she sat on one of the solitary benches set around the warehouses on grass verges that were crisscrossed by roads without pavements. He picked his way clear of subjects that might encourage any mention of a man in her life. If she did ever confess to such, Jason knew that his reaction would be so emotional that his powers to disguise his colossal disappointment would fail. For as long as she never revealed a significant other, a Gaz, Baz, Nigel, Anton, Leon, Jay, or Sti- His wishful thinking about her might continue undiminished. Even an innocent stock-related query before her desk, made by one of his male colleagues, evoked spasms of jealousy so intense that they left Jason dizzy. Perhaps she was religious and saving herself. This was possible because the only jewellery she wore was a crucifix of white gold. He fancied it might convert to anything just to be with her. In Jason's company, during his lunchtime intrusions, she remained passive, half smiling and monosyllabic. But he often harboured a suspicion that she shared some knowledge with his colleagues about him and that his interaction with her was embarrassing to her. He sometimes suspected that at best, Electra was merely humouring him. On the occasions Jason sat beside her, his head would thump with blood while his mouth issued inanities, an observation so lifeless and charmless that self-mutilation seemed the only fitting antidote. She would twist strands of her shoulder-length hair around her finger and then peer at it intently with her young green eyes. Not nervous, but not restful either. Her legs would always be crossed, her lined skirt slithering back from the leading knee, while one foot bounced a high-heeled shoe upon its hidden toes. Such was his obsession with the girl that on the final day of his probation period, he summoned the courage to ask her out. 
as Electra made tea for the entire office, Jason followed her into the kitchen, opened the refrigerator door for no reason, and said, We should go out sometime. After he'd made the request, a silence thickened within the staff kitchen, as if the very air had become a gelatine. While the space inside his ears roared as loudly as an underground tunnel filled with freight trains, as quickly as his disintegrating thoughts could manage, he tried to remember his pre-rehearsed get-out clause. What had he been thinking? He was at least ten years her senior. He was a pest. The insidious word hissed through his mind like a serpent in dry grass. To finally be reduced to this at his age, it made him want to tear his shirt from his untrained, freckled torso, the action accompanied by the howl of a thwarted beast. He had finally lost his reason and was no longer an acceptable person. Okay, where do you want to go? Electra said, without looking at him. Her indifference was created anew in his eyes as boredom. She was bored, bored with it all like him. Not enigmatic, mysterious, coquettish, or coy, or any of the things that his imagination had invested into her. She was merely young and bored. He perceived this as the stark walls of the room shuddered back to their former dimensions. So certain was he of failure and rejection, Jason had not thought as far ahead as to where they might go. Ooh, where's good to go? To go around here? Electra frowned. Nowhere much. Beside the zoo. Jason rented a room in the large subdivided Victorian house in the town's oldest street. An area unhappily separated from where it had originally been founded after the county's lines were redrawn in the 60s. Initially, Jason had hoped to have his own place in Sullivan Trent, but even so far away from London, his credit card debt consumed most of his income, and he was forced to cohabit. All of the residents of the house were male, older than Jason and appeared even more weary and disappointed than he felt. If he could not break his current encirclement of poorly paid employment without prospect, in negligible places set beside motorways, he perceived his new neighbours to be a common portent of what awaited him in the future. Only one resident of the house ever engaged him in conversation. Though Jason wished Gerald had remained as secretive, sullen and retiring as the other grey figures that existed before the muttering televisions of their rooms. But Gerald was one of those unfortunate individuals who hated being alone. While being in possession of a few social graces and no emotional intelligence, Gerald was also an autodidact on council politics which he interspersed with political history, both moribund and local. He always spoke through a half-knowing smile too, employing an ironic tone of voice that helped Jason understand why housemates often murdered each other. But Gerald liked an audience and had selected Jason to fulfill that function when Jason, making an effort to be the gregarious new boy, had been moving his meager belongings into the house. A geniality he now paid a heavy price for whenever he used the kitchen. That part of the building had become a kind of trap laid by the spidery and withered Gerald. His door on the first floor would click open whenever anyone entered the kitchen to boil a kettle or prepare a meal. The insect-like figure would then descend silently and hover about the kitchen door, as if weaving an invisible web that his victims would fail to break through. Should they decide, quite reasonably, 
that hunger and thirst were better alternatives to Gerald's company. But the night before his date with Electra, Jason saw a rare opportunity to employ Gerald's local knowledge to some purpose. An opportunity he had never before discovered in their one-sided interactions. Jason took a ready meal down to the ground floor kitchen and with a magician's flourish hit the open door button of the microwave. The appliance's bell pinged loudly and within three seconds the door to Gerald's room had clicked open. Evening! Gerald said from the doorway and followed this with his customary embellishment. How's life down, Pitt? To which he chortled through his beard, close to tearing up with delight at his own jest. Jason cut out any preliminaries to Gerald's ubiquitous encirclements. Tonight, he'd let him in. I had no idea that Sullet had a zoo. Gerald stopped smiling and frowned. It doesn't. Not in all the years I've lived here. And I would know. You can trust me on that. Jason had such faith in Gerald's local knowledge that this news filled Jason's head with a terrible confusion that lapsed to dread. Electra had made a fool of him then? If Gerald said there was no zoo in Sullet, then none existed. And wasn't a zoo a place where older men like dads and uncles traditionally took younger girls like nieces and daughters on innocent days out? Electra's offer to meet him outside the gates of the zoo the following morning, on Saturday, must have been a disingenuous, mocking rejection that he'd been too stupid to recognize. When Jason arrived at work on Monday, and he accused her of playing a cruel trick, she would say, Did you really think? No, tell me you didn't. I was only joking. No, wait. Don't tell me you actually went and looked for a zoo. In Sully? He could almost hear her voice. His disgrace and humiliation would reach the forklift drivers by elevenses. The material he'd gifted his colleagues with for endless pranks and jibes about all things zoological was limitless. Why had he been so gullible? Sullet had no cinema, no theater, museum, bowling alley. It was simply a place where people existed. Recreation was sought out of town. So how could it possibly boast a zoo? But that was a roll-up right there. Typically, really. Gerald's voice returned to Jason's shocked stupefaction before the microwave oven. As usual, the money wasn't there. Gibbet was running the council into the ground at the time. So instead, they used the budgets on rows that no one needed. Jason's horror at Electra's deception turned into anger. What the hell are you wittering on about? I asked about a zoo, not budgets and roads. Gerald grinned as if Jason was positioned exactly where the older man wanted him to be. What you need to understand... What you need to know is how it all came about. No, I don't. There is no zoo. I know what I need to. Oh, but there was one once. A Pentry Zoological Gardens. In ruins now. You can still see it from the A2546 if you're going towards Bunridge, just before you get to where the man in the moon used to be. And this continued for some time. Another of Gerald's interests was interminable road directions using landmarks that no longer existed. Stop! Jason even held his hands up as if pleading. Please, stop. The zoo. 
there was a zoo, but it's no longer open. That's what I said. When Gibbet, stop, slow down, please. This zoo, the zoo itself is still there. So, what else is there? Gerald frowned. In terms of leisure activities, fun fair, restaurant, pub, whatever, why would anyone go there now? Well, they wouldn't, unless they belonged to the local historical society. I was once the secretary from Gerald's. Why would the local historical society go there? Because of the architecture, of course. It's one of the last remaining Victorian zoos built by Bellowby. A testament to inhumanity. If you were an animal shipped over from Africa or Asia, then the last place you'd want to end up inside was Pentry Zoological Gardens. You see, what you need to understand... So it's a museum of sorts, open to the public? Uh, not likely. There's never been enough money to pull it down, let alone preserve it. So it's derelict? This is a derelict Victorian zoo? More or less. Why do you ask? I'm going there tomorrow, to meet a friend. Gerald's eyes burned with an opportunist's glee. Well, all right, I've nothing on. I'll come too. There's no point going unless someone's with you who knows the story. No, no, thanks. But no, it's a date. A date? With a girl? There? Gerald's shock was shared in equal amounts between the idea that Jason would even know a woman and the idea that they would visit the abandoned zoo together. The story we don't need. Sorry, local history, that sort of thing wouldn't quite work. Gerald deflated at the rebuff. Maybe she knows all about it then. I doubt that. And then Jason wondered if he was meant to find the zoo locked up in ruins on Saturday morning, as if that were to serve as an epitaph to his romantic aspirations. Or was she suggesting that he were an animal that should be locked up? The best place for him after pestering her at work and staring at her legs for months. My God, he thought and seemed to shrink inside. Was it that noticeable, his leering? A bad business. Religious nutters finished off what a shortage of funds began. His miserable reverie broken, Jason looked at Gerald. What? What did you say? A question he'd never thought he'd ever ask Gerald. What bad business? What notice are you talking about? Gerald appeared to expand with the spirits that had so recently deserted him. The animals all died. Horribly. Poisoned. They suspected. The chemicals had drifted over from the works out to the bunnel. Place that had been in decline, of course, for years. So the poor beasts were in bad shape. No money, you see, way before the animal rights lot got to organize the animals. His welfare was in serious decline. But a group of swivel-eyed evangelists had actually been going into the enclosures and poisoning the animals at night. The Sisters of the White Cross, they called themselves. They had a temple out Rudry Way, but it's a teeth-whitening place now. And for the first time, as a resident in the house, Jason stood still, without fidgeting, or looking at his watch, or breaking away to make phone calls that he did not need to make. And he listened to Gerald. Hi. 
Electra's eyes smiled with a warmth he'd not known them capable of. Questions he wanted to ask her tripped over each other in his mind, like clowns wearing long shoes. His thoughts were enshrouded by a fog of both confusion and desire that refused to lift, but there was no doubt that this was a date. The realization made him shiver. A young woman would not have worn boots with spike heels and tight so shimmery that they appeared wet or a stretchy miniskirt and that much makeup, unless she intended to impress. She must have spent hours on her hair, too. How do I get in? He followed this with, Why here? When the girl was now struggling to recognize as his colleague showed him a gap between a metal pole and the tented security wire attached to the upright. Electra didn't answer Jason's question, but smiled and dipped eyes, made entrancing by a pair of false eyelashes. When he said, You look amazing, by the way. One turnstile of the far attached to the ticket booths soon turned with a loud metallic knocking as they each passed through the original entrance. A long wooden frontage bore faded depictions of animals with human-like faces. The mildly unpleasant notion of the turnstile's sound echoing far out to what lay beyond the gates. Like a curious doorbell, was dispelled when Jason was confronted with what stretched around him. He found himself on a wide tarmac forecourt once designed to receive large crowds. Opposite the turnstiles was a boarded-up gift shop and a shuttered go-ape cafe. Facades of animal-themed slideshows stretched to a disused toddler's fairground. In there, the gaudy plastic reds and yellows of the little fairground rides remained bright within the encroaching tree line. In the distance, a small train intended for children slumped on punctured tires against a miniature platform that was embellished with gingerbread filigree or ironwork. A toilet block with a flat roof had mostly been engulfed by moss and dead tree branches. Tall, busy weeds erupted through th footpaths. Food wrappers faded enough to appear bleached covered most of the ground. But above the concessions, a steep hill, reminiscent of a small alpine mountain, rose into low grey cloud. Peering toward the mist, enshrouded summit, he glimpsed concrete enclosures, rusty metal poles and tatters of wire hanging from them. A decaying cable car ride, and signs of footpaths cutting through the wild, deciduous foliage. The zoological gardens had been built into tiers around the hill, all connected by a winding path that began on their left. The bizarre and exotic surroundings excited Jason as if he were a child. He wondered if he didn't underestimated the girl at his side. Had she a sensitivity to the strange beauty of dereliction, an empathy unfettered by intellectualism to past grandeur, an interest, at the very least, in local history. He wanted to take her in his arms and kiss her pretty mouth hard and move his hands over her diminutive curves. She seemed to read his ardour, and not be appalled by it. She smiled. This might be the only interesting thing about Sully. His remark also pleased her. Amidst such ruin, her sudden laugh was melodic, magical. He'd never heard her laugh before. There's nothing like this anywhere else. She raised her face to the hill 
as if in adoration. Never makes me want to see it when it was open. Jason wasn't sure he entirely grasped the sentiment, but wanted to agree with her. Though, there was something about Electra's enthusiasm that also made him suspect that she might be mad. Mad, but beautiful, like the Sisters of the White Cross, according to Gerald. One of them had been a local beauty, who'd once been crowned Miss Great Britain. She'd taken the veil for the sect after succumbing to its obsession with the Garden of Eden before the fall of man. Why here? Why do you come here? Electra's face adopted this half-concealed smile he knew too well. He hoped it was merely playful. Because it makes me happy, peaceful-like. You come here a lot? Loads. On your own? Mostly. Sometimes I meet friends. The idea should have been reassuring, but such was his greed for the girl he preferred the idea of being alone here, a place she would only share with him. They might be here later. We can meet up. Your friends are coming? He hoped his disappointment wasn't obvious. Electra set off up the path on their left, as much to cut off his interrogation, he sensed, as to show him more. Her face betrayed an eagerness to get higher more quickly than his new shoes would allow him to. Her posture also seemed looser, more limber, while her face remained angled upwards as if to catch the sun's rays. He was seeing a side to the girl he had never glimpsed at work, and she was becoming harder to recognise as every minute passed. He tried to combat this estrangement by talking to her. You know what happened here, in the seventies, before you were even born? He found himself in danger of reciting parts of Gerald's monologue that had lasted for over an hour the previous evening. A discourse that had been rich with details about the cult who destroyed the zoo's complement of animals incriminately, embellished with council politics that had subsequently kept the place shut, more than the breathlessness caused by the ascent. A sudden horror at the insidious influence of Gerald in his companionless existence made him stop talking. Oh, you know about that? There was a spine of sarcasm in Electra's tone. She stopped by a vast canopy constructed from steel poles and netting. Great rents and holes gaped in the overgrown enclosures covering. Rotten logs and a deep lake of dead leaves consumed the floor. The middle of the area was a thicket of unmanaged tree growth. High on the rear cement's wall were the unappealing mouths of two artificial caves. Electra grinned at the abandoned enclosure, as if she had spotted a rare and shy animal inside. Jason cleared the signage with one hand, a steel placard upon which a map of Africa was embossed. With a finger, he traced the species of the former occupants. Gelada baboons. How do they get in, I wonder? The women, the, the nutters who poison the animals? Electra had chose to remain mute. It irritated Jason. He filled the uncomfortable silence again. One of the women was killed, but not by the lions or the tiger they had here. Back then, like you'd think, an elephant got her. Can you imagine that? According to Gerald, an ancient and blind pachyderm called Dolly had used its head to press one of the sisters of the White Cross against the floor of its pen. She had been the beauty queen. She'd crept in to soak the straw with arsenic, but had the life crushed out of her. The elephant had also placed its knees upon her legs and held its position. 
while pressing her with its vast skull until she was dead. Concluding her silent communication with the stained rocks and deadwood where Primus had once scampered, Electra turned away from the railings and moved further up the hill. They always get things wrong, she said, though Jason was confused as to who they signified. People don't know what's happened here, she added. Oh, they do. Nuts has killed every animal except the reptiles. Apparently they bludgeoned the smaller ones they could corner. Doesn't surprise me at all that the town, he'd nearly said council, and that would just not do on a date. Wants to keep the place quiet. Makes it all a bit eerie, don't you think? Once you know the story. I think the surviving women were committed. Jason was aware his comments were displeasing Electra. Perhaps it was their morbidity, a tone that he could not shake from his thoughts now that he was inside the zoo. People don't know why it happened. They weren't there. She said this sharply, but with a sly look in her lovely eyes, as if she were privy to a need-to-know secret that she could not disclose. It made her seem simple and immature. You shouldn't have opinions if you don't know the facts, she added. Horrible things happen for good reasons. Don't you know that? Yes, of course, he said too quickly, desperate to return her mood to what it had been. He followed her in silence, was led past horribly small overgrown cages for owls, kookaburras, macaques, scarlet macaws, and Amazon parrots. The ascent made Jason sweat and wheeze, which he tried to conceal by dropping just behind her line of sight. Electra clipped on, her small and lovely legs sheening in the thin metal light and effortlessly sending her ahead to the foot of a long cement staircase that led to another level. A sign beside the worn metal handrail at the foot of the stairs indicated that orangutans, gibbons, chimpanzees and lemurs once wild away their captivity somewhere above. Dense branches of small trees arched over the steep passage, sealing out most of the natural light. Jason would have to bend over to get through. You coming or what? Electra said. He was almost too winded to speak. Is there another way? The heel of his left foot was now smitten with a hot and painful blister. From the hilltop, from out of the fog reeved trees, came a sharp cry that he wanted to believe was human. And into his mind came suggestions of yellow teeth, of dust being kicked up in clouds by clawed black feet. He imagined thin, hairy limbs racing up tree branches and enraged pursuit of other furred shapes. Electra giggled, and for a moment, before she slipped up into the dark tunnel that surrounded the staircase, her expression seemed especially salacious. Wanton, though cruel, and much older than it should have appeared on such a young face. So quickly did he turn to where he guessed the noise had issued from, Jason fell against the railings at the mouth of the staircase. His sight groped about the dark, wet trees above. He peered into the distance at the pointed cement roofs, vaguely alien in the way they poked through the mist and treetops nearer the summit. And where the mist hung about the peak, he was also struck by the unappealing suggestion of a ruined temple returned to some steaming jungle on an Asian mountain range. The shriek, the fog, the wildness of the trees, all conspired in his mind to make him suspect that he had passed beyond the margins of Sultapon Trent, a town not really belonging anywhere either. Further up the stone staircase, Electra's tipped, 
heels clicked through the shadows. Jason followed. He called her name twice and said, Hang on! She laughed sweetly from a greater distance than seemed feasible. Within the smothering canopy of tree branches, Jason soon struggled to see where he was placing his feet. His breath was loud about his head, his heart beat inside his skull. Stumbling forward, one hand flailed to where he hoped the railing might be. But amidst the scent of leaf mulch and wet earth, a trace of a perfume lingered. He chased the fragrance. Daylight eventually formed a coin of white gold when he rounded a corner on the cement staircase. As he neared the top, Electra's lovely blonde head appeared and joyfully cried, Keep up! before vanishing. The comments made Jason feel twice his age. He only stopped struggling upwards when startled by a second shriek. A cry at the side of the staircase, mere feet away from where he laboured. An animal scream followed by a boisterous scampering toward his position, which swiftly evolved into a determined progress of a presence that he could not see, passing over his head. It was aware of him below, though of that he was certain, as much as he was certain of the speed and strength of whatever thrashed through the darkness above. When Jason eventually made the top of the staircase, he was near insensible with exhaustion and fear. But Electra was not waiting for him on the wide and green and concrete path. He peered back into the narrow tunnel he had emerged crouching from, with the taste of blood and panic in his mouth. Down there, all was quiet again, but he was now certain that the Sisters of the White Cross had failed to destroy every animal that had been kept in captivity here, four decades earlier. Some kind of ape must have survived the bred descendants. Indigenous British wildlife included nothing that could have made such an infernal cry nor anything capable of such agility so high above the ground. This must form part of the appeal to Electra and her trespassing friends. They knew that the zoological gardens were not quite as empty as the town thought. She'd wanted to surprise him with something special and secret that he could not see anywhere else. Her cryptic comments made more sense to Jason. But where was she? He feared their data had degenerated into a childish game of hide-and-seek. He was too tired and shaken to ever get into the spirit of something like that now. Even if the taste of her mouth was waiting as a reward for his being a good sport, Jason wanted to go home. Enclosures for animals lined each side of the only possible route onwards, fronted by raised viewing platforms. His repeated cries of, Electra! were greeted with misty silence that he mistook for anticipation in the verdure around him. The only tolerable way out of here for him was forward and up to eventually get down again. The original design of the zoo was much clearer. Visitors would move to the summit, circling the sides while viewing the animal attractions on the scent. Other features must await on descent. He was now flanked by the orangutan and chimpanzee houses. He worked this out from the badly painted depiction of an orange ape on a viewing platform. In the opposite pen, chains still suspended a complex arrangement of logs from which chimpanzees once capered. To his dismay, and a dread that he now tried to swallow like a lump in the throat, he noticed that some of the hanging logs were gently swaying from its recent use. He expected to see a black face peer out from one of the lightless doorways that were burrowed into the cement wall of the chimp's old home. The detritus of tree slumps and dead tree branches littered the broad disclosure basin. Behind him, in the orangutan area, 
there came the sound of a heavy object flopping into water. Wide-eyed and breathing like an asthmatic, Jason rushed to the railings closest to the sound, eschewing the viewing platform that looked structurally unsafe. There was a moat twenty feet below. It must have once kept the apes inside their pen or provided recreation. It's now brimmed with a thick soup of dirty rainwater, upon which bobbed a carpet of dead leaves, the mulch of ages, and woody flotsam. One portion of the surface had been disturbed. A circle of expanding ripples had stirred to lap greasily against the greening cement banks on either side of the moat. Whatever had just submerged did not resurface. Beyond the moat stood a half-rotten treehouse, and two large and rusticated stone figures of apes. To Jason they appeared like the crude figures of imbecilic gods, forgotten and left behind in their polluted grotto. A rich and bestial spore, sulfurous, fresh, nitrate rich, reaching brain deep and in danger of turning his stomach, assailed Jason from each side of the path. He moved away, quickly, and to a junction offering three new pathways, one up, one down, one straight ahead. Electra! He roared in fear as much as anger through his voice sounded feeble and broken amongst the damp trees. If he wasn't mistaken, the air was now much warmer too, and odiferous with the scent of a wet forest floor. A response seemed to come from high up, a horrible cry that whoop whoop whooped and then croaked into what could have been demented laughter. Another descendant of escaped apes, he hoped. But what could they have found to eat in here? Jason was closer to the summit now, about halfway up in fact, and had a better view of what waited up there. If he were to venture any higher, a series of domed cement roofs, like a miniature Sydney Opera house, poked between two large oaks. Perhaps this was one of the stylistic features that Gerald had attributed historical value to. The head of a dirty penguin statue was also visible. The chipped stone beak was open beneath the blank and indifferent sky. The cement bird was forever poised to call out a lament of solitude and imprisonment, a shriek from the accursed place in which it had been abandoned. Jason's imagination began to chatter like a frightened monkey in floodwater. On the very summit, part of a red-tiled roof was visible. Directly below that were the tops of the trees parted. Electra walked into view. She was not alone. Electra was talking to at least three other people. Women, Jason thought and all wearing dark clothing. But against a background of this cold cement, the faces of her companions appeared especially pale. They all turned and looked down at him. Electra waved enthusiastically. Her friends remained still and were content to stare. At a trot, Jason rounded a walled paddock for giraffes now filled with broken bricks and masonry, where Tapper, Capybara, and Barbary sheep once paced back and forth. Their fiefdoms had long been given over to choking bracken, blackberry vines, and long grasses. Hobbling past on blistered feet, he intuited an atmosphere pregnant with apprehension, or perhaps one even tense with animosity because he was intruding upon a territory in which he was unwelcome. Ridiculous to feel this way, or so he tried to persuade himself. A few feral descendants of the original apes had given him a turn. That was all. Once he reached Electra, he'd make her explain the strange cries. But 
what could she offer as an explanation of what had slipped into that oily moat about the orangutan enclosure? Stealing himself not to look beyond the iron bars, he rushed past, so as not to allow the rubbish stewed and increasingly smelly dereliction to affect him. Jason finally arrived, out of breath and wet through with perspiration at the place he had last seen Electra. Once again, he found himself alone and overlooking a lagoon of miserly proportions. A dirty cement cavity cramped with dead verdure, where sea lions had once glided for a bit before being forced to make a turn. Impossibly, despite four decades of dereliction, the stagnant concrete bowl still issued the scent of decaying marine life. On the opposite side of the broad paved area was the domed concrete structure he had seen from below, with a painted roof designed to resemble ice and snow. It had once housed penguins, the only flightless bird remaining was the worn, sad and peeling stone creation he'd seen above the treetops. From this angle, age and rustication had made its one visible eye mad with what looked like panic. The doors to what was called the Arctic Arena were long gone, but the stench that wafted from out of the darkness overrode Jason's curiosity to see beyond the aperture. When he called out for Electra again, he wasn't answered by a shriek from the tree line, but his cries did incite the repetitive scrape of what sounded like the raking of dry leaves from inside the Arctic Arena. Whatever was disturbing the most recent leaf fall was not. He was sure his date. The area below and around him felt neither stable nor safe, having now burned right through his patience and any reasonable and reliable sense of where he was now. When he tried to push on to locate his date at the very summit, he tripped over his feet twice. His breathing was ragged, his thoughts hapless, his clothes were sopping and his throat was salted with a terrible thirst. Up, some deep and rarely used instinct told him she would be up there, waiting at the top. He continued upwards. He found Electra at the summit. She sat at one of a score of metal picnic tables, arranged outside a boarded up restaurant with a red roof. She looked preoccupied, if not bored again, like she did at work. Her lovely pink lips had been freshly glossed and were parted as she gazed at the one-story reptile house on the far side of the outdoor dining area. She'd crossed her legs and allowed the hem of her skirt to slither back to a pair of golden stocking tops, each welt impressed with short suspender clips. Her companions were nowhere in sight. Jason could not readily find the will to speak and had his thoughts unlocked from the stupefied paralysis brought on by his fatigue and fear. He could not be sure of what he might say to her about his experience below. More than the sudden presence of Electra, it was the air temperature that brought him to a halt. A withering heat smouldered through the whitish vapours above him and sank upon the dining area. He stripped his overcoat from his shoulders and arms, sweat clouded his shirt and jeans heat of his body may actually have steamed into the thick atmosphere. He couldn't be certain. You took your time, Electra said with a cruel smile. Where? The others? Jason blinked the sweat out of his eyes and looked at the sky. There was no sun. You want to know why it was done? Sorry? I'll show you the way. What? 
Electra screamed out. We're ready! Behind the closed metal doors of the reptile house, something began to thump and thrash itself against the walls, the ceiling and the floor. The sound suggested an impressive weight and size. The occupant then made a circular swishing sound in what might have been sand. The metal doors shook within their frames. Jason fell as much as turned to the bench where Electra sat, but pulled up short when the girl stood and raised the hemline of her tight skirt to her waist. What would have been a shocking though arousing exposure in other circumstances now struck Jason as crude and unpleasant. Electra's hairless sex was barely concealed by the transparent black underwear she wore, cut like shorts around her shapely buttocks and tummy. Her strong legs shimmered in nylon. We've got to be like beasts to go with the others. Quick! Do it quickly! She said and dropped her head back as if she were already in the throes of ecstasy or suffering a fit. Despite his revulsions, Jason's penis thickened and unfurled like some insensible python, motivated alone by scent and instinct. The girl was offering herself, but whether it was to him or something else, he wasn't sure. What he took for her anticipation of imminent appearance from within the reptile house, and of whatever it actually was that coiled, thrived and butted against the old metal doors, made Jason whimper like a child. Electra's moans were either caused by her own fear, or arousal, or both. Beneath the summit erupted a din of bestial shrieks, bellows and roars as if the zoological gardens were full again, and anticipating a long overdue feeding time. The tree line around the leaf-strewn picnic area began to thrash, like a clash of arms in some ancient battle. Heat from an invisible sun beat Jason's uncovered head more intensely and boiled his thoughts into higher spikes of panic and terror. Come on, let him into your heart, into your heart, Electra said as she lay back upon the picnic table and widened her thighs. Jason fled for the mouth of the path that must lead down away from the summit. Much older female voice cried shrilly from behind the shuttered ice cream counter of the derelict restaurant. Lie down with the little black lamb! Jason tried to look in that direction but lost his balance and fell, cutting both his knees and hands. The pain sobered him enough to get back to his feet. The double doors of the reptile house were broken apart from within. They grated horribly across the paving, a great hot stench of rotten meat and chitin belched like poisonous gas across the summits. Two painfully thin women in dusty black gowns came through the opening and staggered across the paving. As they stumbled forward, they batted the sides of their heads as if to concuss the very horrors concealed within their skulls. Electra thrust her sex higher into the air as if eager for penetration. The two haggard female spectres fell to their knees and wept. Between them leapt a thick black form. Propelled out from the reptile house and into daylight it came. Like a horrid tongue. A girth as thick as a soil pipe flopped heavily against the dirty ground. The thing's head slapped the paving just short of Electra. Her head covered in soiled bandages that were open and reddish at their conclusion. What Jason glimpsed of the form's black hide appeared as a sandy as that of a dead Leviathan found upon a beach at low tide. Jason fled over the lip of the hill, a great turnstile ground behind him, or somewhere within the low, hot clouds above. He bit through his tongue and kicked off both shoes. 
Halfway down the hill, he climbed over the wall of a reeking enclosure once intended for brown bears, and then squashed himself deep inside the open cage at the rear end of the pen. The occupant within, half buried under the dead leaves, appeared even more frightened than he felt.